Hi everyone, I'm Gary Naughton. I'd like to welcome you to this program. Today we are continuing with our Conversations with Remarkable Minds series. Today we're going to talk with Dr. Lester Brown. The subject will be everything about the environment, not just as we are engaging it today, but what is most likely to occur over the next five to ten years. And what can we as individuals do? What must we do as a government, state, local, national? But what happens if our governments decide that, well, there, there will be talk about doing things, there will be committees formed, but there won't be any real change, not for the time period when the politicians are in office. Leave that for the future. But as long as we say we're studying it, we're serious about it, you know, they put the political spin on it. What does it mean? What's going on? Can the environment hold off collapsing in different areas from tipping until we have the political will to demand change? Every time we want to change something in the environment that would help the environment and help us, you see all these voices raised saying, no, it's anti-business and uh, you would cause too much suffering to the bottom line of corporations. As a result, it doesn't get done. After all, look how many years we argued, is global warming real? And we should have known that a long time ago. We should have had a consensus. We should have already been 15 years further along than what we are. Lester Brown is going to talk about this and also food shortages and how those food shortages could bring down civilization as we know it. And why aren't we paying attention as Americans to what's going on around the rest of the world? It's amazing when I travel around the world and I talk with just average people, especially in Europe. They're way ahead of us on living a more green existence and having uh, commuter trains that are uh, low cost and easy to use and fast and efficient and, and clean. We're, we're behind them on all these levels, so we're going to talk about that. Later in the program, Obama is no FDR, much less Gandhi, according to Eric Stoner from Common Dreams, and Mike Adams, the health ranger, naturalnews.com, just uh, sent an email out. I thought it was interesting, and I'm going to ask you to give your feedback. Do you believe he is accurate or not on this, on what happens if we pass the current health care legislation that would then make it against the law for you not to buy health insurance, and you could go to jail and be fined $25,000 if you didn't buy health insurance from one of these companies. I'll go to his commentary and then your feedback. And then, of course, health and nutrition. Let's first go over and say hello to my guest, Lester Brown. Dr. Lester Brown, nice to have you with us today. I I can hear you. Um, Let me give you the overview, and please take your time. Uh, There's no rush, there's no breaks, and go into great depth on your answers, okay? Okay. Because we... We have an enormous audience listening all over the world, 160 countries, plus on Voice America. And a lot of them are not familiar with what you're going to be talking about. So we need to kind of fill in the gaps for them. Here's my first issue. What are some of the most urgent myths being held by policymakers and corporations and the public that are preventing us from really tackling the many environmental crises confronting us? And also explain to us why there is this large segment of individuals and even many of our elected officials who deny humanity's role in climate change? Well, there there seems to be um, a general um, presumption in in this country, one that has uh, existed for some time, that cutting carbon emissions would be one, difficult if not impossible, two, would uh, uh, disrupt the, um, the economy um, and um, um, would, uh, would put us at a disadvantage in uh, competing in the world economy. It turns out that <clears throat> there's, there's no foundation um, uh, for any of <clears throat> those comments. And what we've seen in the last um, two years, that is, um, um, 2008 and 2009 is a reduction in the United States in carbon emissions of 9%. Now, partly this is the result of the recession, of course, 
but partly it's because of gains in efficiency and also um, quite a bit of new, <clears throat> um, new power coming online that's carbon free. Um, um, 8,400 megawatts uh, um, of wind generating capacity coming online, which is um, has no uh, no carbon emissions at all. Um, so there <clears throat> there are there are things happening now. One of the difficulties in formulating the problem is that um, some people don't have the science background, um, though it doesn't take all that much. Uh, I think junior high school science class is enough to um, help one understand the, the, the greenhouse gas effect and what it translates into in its basic uh, physics. But <clears throat> there's a real reluctance to um, to face the um, the issue in a in a meaningful way, um, and when you when you look around the world at what's happening and you realize how fast ice is melting, for example, um, you begin to see that the you know the 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 seeds of some catastrophic climate change. <clears throat> it's interesting in looking at. Um, ice melting, for example, um, or the relationship specifically between ice melting and food security. Um, we know that the Greenland ice sheet is melting. We know that if it melts entirely, it will raise sea level by 23 feet. I mean, imagine what the world's maps would look like and where the coastlines would be if the Greenland ice sheet were to melt entirely. That would probably take <clears throat> two or three centuries for that to happen, but it clearly can happen if we stay on course. Um, and so we're seeing two things now. We're seeing the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, and we're seeing it melting at an accelerating rate. Now, <clears throat> if we only had a three-foot rise or one-meter rise in sea level, we would inundate a large share of the rice-growing uh, river delta regions of, of Asia. Rice. <clears throat> Rice, as you know, is one of the world's uh, two food staples, the other being wheat. Um, the World Bank has published a map of Bangladesh showing that the one meter rise in sea level covers half of its rice land. This is a country of 152 million people. In Vietnam, it's the Mekong Delta, which produces half of Vietnam's rice, that's, that's highly vulnerable to a, a rise in, uh, in sea level. And there are another 18 or 20 um, um, rice growing river deltas that would be um, very vulnerable to, uh, to sea level rise. So I mention that because the, um, the world rice crop would be the, the first of the, of the major crops, the first of the two stables, two uh, leading food staples, wheat and rice, um, would be the one that would be hardest by ice melting, um, <clears throat> by the melting of the ice sheets. But it is also the case that it's the ice melt from glaciers in the Himalayas and on the Tibetan Plateau that sustains the major river systems of Asia during the dry season. Um, and the ice melt not only sustains the river systems, but the irrigation systems that depend on those rivers during the dry season. Um, and when we look at, at China, we see a country that is the world's leading producer of wheat. We look at India, and we see the number two producer of wheat. The U.S. incidentally is number third, and is is number three. Um, and then we look at rice, and China and India totally dominate the world rice harvest. So what happens to these glaciers, to these rivers, to these irrigation systems, and to the wheat and rice harvests in China and India? are of concern to the entire world. Um, <clears throat> in the um, United States, um, I think it's tempting for us to look at the melting of the ice um, on the Tibetan Plateau and say, well, you know, that's, that's China's problem. It is China's problem, but it's all, also our problem because if China loses those glaciers and the, the dry season river flow um, from them, um, it'll be in trouble on the food front and we'll be coming into the world market for massive quantities of grain in the same way um, that it already has for soybeans. I think this year, um, 
China, which is the home of the soybean, will be importing 70% of its soybean consumption. Um, so <clears throat> if China comes into the world market for large quantities of grain, it will come to the United States because we totally dominate world grain trade. And that puts, puts Americans in a, in, in a, in a, new, uh, a new situation because it means that we in the United States would be competing with 1.3 billion Chinese with rapidly rising incomes for our grain supply. This would obviously drive up food prices here and we would be tempted to restrict exports because we've done that historically when things got really tight. The problem is <clears throat> that China is our banker and it is it is the Chinese who are here in town every month when the Treasury auctions off securities to cover our fiscal deficit. And they've been buying our, our Treasury securities for years and years now. As a result, they hold over $700 billion in U.S. Treasury securities. $1.3 so, um in, in total, because they've also earned quite a bit in their balance of trade surplus. And what that... Um, what that um, means is that China's our banker. And so, like it or not, we're going to be sharing our grain harvest with the Chinese in the future, um, uh, regardless of what happens to our um, um, uh, regardless of whether we want to or or not. Shouldn't we also add in Japan, a small country that does most of its importing of food, uh, and it's uh, also, f until recently, it was the number one uh, trade surplus with the United States. And then behind that, we have, behind China and Japan, we also have Saudi Arabia. That's and right. They're running out of uh, food uh, to, that they can actually grow as w they were actually wheat efficient for 20 years, and now they're not. So now these countries are buying large tracts of land or leasing them in Russia, largest uh, country in the world, as far as land mass, uh, especially if you consider that Ukraine is an enormously rich and fertile area as well. Uh, not that the Ukraine is part of Russia. It's not, but it, it, it once was as far as a land mass and uh, contiguous. And so they're going out and taking the dollars, frequently dollars that Americans, you know, that got, they got from America for giving us loans, and they're buying up that using those, uh, using those uh, IOUs as ways of making this deal. So we better pay careful attention to which countries cannot feed themselves in the future and how much pressure that's going to be placing on us, especially if we're buying oil from one and having another get by our debt. Because when the Treasury prints money and it doesn't have it, and it doesn't have it, we are broke as a nation. If we couldn't borrow money, here's something people refuse to... No politician says this, but this is the truth. If we could not borrow money, we would be in bankruptcy. We would be insolvent. And that's not even including our unfunded or underfunded entitlements over the next 20 years, which is $67 trillion, just that part. So when we talk about water and food and our interrelationship with other countries, this puts us at loggerheads. And why aren't we having this discussion at the national level or in the national media? Your thoughts, please. No, it's an, it's an interesting question, Gary. Um, I sometimes wonder if <clears throat> one of the problems is that things have become so complex in the world that the people who work in various government departments and, and so forth who work on pieces of it, um, but there's no one at the top who has the time to put the pieces together and to see what it means. I mean, the idea that the melting ice sheet on Greenland could drive up the world price of rice sounds sort of far-fetched, but it's, there's a very direct uh, tie there. You mentioned Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> the history of that, of that situation is interesting because after the um, oil export embargo of the 1970s, the Saudis realized that they would be vulnerable to a counter grain export embargo because they were importing most of the grain. And so they began looking for ways to produce more grain internally and um, using their oil drilling technology and equipment, they began drilling 
um, around the country to see if they could find any water. And they found an aquifer about a half mile down. Um, but it's a fossil aquifer, that is, it does not recharge. This was water that was put together in geological time, eons ago. Um, and so they started pumping it. And as you noted, they've been self-sufficient in wheat for more than 20 years. But then last year, <clears throat> they made a, a public announcement that uh, that aquifer was largely depleted and that they were going to systematically reduce their wheat harvest one-eighth each year until by 2016 they would be entirely out of the grain production business. At that point, they'll be importing all their grain for what will be a Canada-sized population of roughly 30 million people. Now, what's interesting about this is not that <clears throat> Saudi Arabia losing its wheat production capacity is going to dramatically alter the world grain balance. It will not, because they produce, you know, maybe one half of one percent of the world's uh, wheat uh, supply. But what it does show is what happens when the wells go dry, and that's <clears throat> that's happening in so many countries around the world now. It's just that the Saudis have gotten there first, and they've been willing to go public with it. A lot of governments will not talk about what's happening with our water tables and how fast they're being depleted and what it's going to translate into. But we do know from a World Bank study of India, for example, um, that 15% of the people in, in India are being fed with grain produced from wells that are being overpumped, from wells that will be going dry one of these days. Um, 15% of India's population is 175 million people. Um, so that's, that's kind of scary when you realize that um, um, a population that size, 175 million, um, is going to be, um, is, is subsisting by, um, with grain produced from wells um, that are going to be going dry. The comparable number for China is 130 million people being fed with grain produced from irrigation wells that will be going dry. And you begin putting this together, and you can see, one, that this overpumping phenomenon is pretty much a phenomenon, you know, is confined to the last, the last half century or so, because up until that time, we didn't have the pumping capacity uh, anywhere in the world, really, to deplete aquifers. Now we do, and 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 we're just beginning to see um, the first countries, Saudi Arabia being a prime example, um, running into the uh, the wall here, so to speak. Um, so the, the interesting thing is that water tables are falling in so many countries at the same time, and that includes the United States. It's it's not going to threatened famine here, but under the, the Great Plains um, of the United States and states like Texas and Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, Nebraska, and eastern Colorado, that part of the country is being, um, they have quite a bit of irrigation, mostly for corn production, and they're pumping from the Ogallala Aquifer, which is also a fossil aquifer. And then in California, water tables are falling almost everywhere uh, because of the tightening water supply there. But for the world as a whole, and I could talk about Mexico, I could talk about Yemen, I could talk about Pakistan, I could talk about Spain, uh, but there's so many countries now where water tables are falling and we're over-consuming. I mean, we've created sort of a, um, a water bubble food economy that, and, and that bubble's gonna burst one of these days, country by country, it's burst first in Saudi Arabia. There are many more countries on that list. And I just don't think, Gary, that the world is prepared for the tightening of, of the food supply that will come from um, as more and more irrigation wells go dry. I appreciate your overview. I would like to then bring it back to the United States and give, uh, give us a more in-depth um, hypothesis of what could happen and let me just lead into it with this. Many of the apologists in, who don't want to see anything change with environmental uh, regulations keep saying, yes, but it'll be 200 years before 
the glaciers melt, uh, like on Antarctica, the two major ones there, one the size of Spain, one size of France, or uh, Greenland, three times the size of Texas. And I say, hold on a second. How do you know? I've interviewed all the leading climatologists I could find on this, and they say that we're in chaos theory now, that we don't know when the large chunks, because A, they found that there were multiple lakes that we never knew existed under the ice. They thought there was two miles of ice and it was solid ice. Now we're finding out it's not solid ice everywhere. Also, they never knew that there were caverns in in, in, uh, Greenland that look like a gigantic waterfalls where there are millions upon hundreds of millions of gallons a day pouring down in these crevices which then hit the rock and we don't have any cameras down there so we don't have any measurements to see what's happening with that water that melts on the top of the glacier that goes down is it acting as a skid is it able to move it they have theoretical models but no actual models then they were they didn't realize that much of the ice that's melting off and breaking off Greenland was coming under the water, not just what you see on top. We've all seen a, uh, a, a ice wall, and suddenly it breaks and falls in the water in a big splash. We didn't know that it was what was breaking off underneath the water that no one was seeing. And then suddenly you'd see these icebergs, and now you see ten times more icebergs around where this this is uh, these ledges are. And this ice is going in, so clearly uh, we miscalculated. Also, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of little lakes, depending upon the time of year, that could be four foot deep, eight foot deep, ten foot deep, two miles across, that we didn't used to have because the summers weren't that hot. Now they are. That That is melting. You have ma- major fractures everywhere. And so when the people I speak to say the following... It's political uh, cleverness when they say, don't worry, it's 200 years. But they said it would be 200 years before the Larson B. Shelf melted and cracked off, and it was 29 days after a conference said it would be 200 years. The buffering, that which actually holds the uh, major glaciers on south in Antarctica from falling faster into the ocean, those have been breaking off. Therefore... It's like someone pushing you in the door, and you've got 25 people on the other side pushing to keep them out. And one at a time, the people that you're having put their shoulder against the door break their shoulders and fall down. And now you're down to a few people, and the door is starting to open. We don't know when we will see a one-foot rise. Don't think about 200 feet from South, uh, Antarctica if it all melted. Don't think about 23 feet from Greenland. Think about one foot. One foot, that's enough to get water into the New York City subway uh, system and the underground systems of Washington, D.C., of of Savannah, uh, of major cities up and down the east coast of the United States. Because remember, our infrastructures are frequently below ground, sometimes 10 to 20 stories below ground. You would see a massive problem of having to re-engineer to keep the water from coming in, because once it starts coming in, it's not going to stop. And then also you would have entire cities gone, like Dubai, because all of Dubai is built at or below sea level, and especially the insanity, I said it at the time, of building those uh, artificial islands done in the shape of palm leaves where you have 10 and $15 million homes. If the ocean rises six inches, six inches, they, all of those pilings are resting on sand. There's no rock. Sand. And now when I run up the beach, I just did a championship race last weekend in, in Florida. I flew in. I did uh, three championship races. I said did you I, say in Florida? In Florida. I, I was in Fort Lauderdale. And what was interesting, mm-hmm. I got there late at night, and the race was 7 in the morning. And, uh, and as I was loosening up, I'm running up the beach, and I look, and I suddenly see something. I'm seeing seaweed on the bottom of buildings and on the bottom of swimming pool walls. Really? I'd never seen that before. And I'm not talking about a few feet, and I'm thinking, holy cow. 
So there was a guy on a uh, tractor that goes up and down the beach to smooth it out. And I said to the guy, I said, do you all have to bring sand in here often? He just laughed. He said, are you kidding? He said, in the last three years, we have been bringing in hundreds and hundreds of gigantic truckloads of sand just for this area because it keeps getting washed up because it keeps rising. He said, come out here at night, come out here at three in the morning, and you'll see how high the water table is. It's higher than it's ever been before. But I'm, I'm seeing some sea. And now from, you have from uh, Key West, no, not Key West, but, but from Homestead to above uh, almost Orlando uh, to uh, uh, Daytona Beach, you have over 10,000 high-rise buildings built right up to the sea, and they're all built on sand, not bedrock. There is no bedrock. Pilings, concrete pilings to hold the buildings up, but the base of those has to rest on something. If they rest on rock, that's a good thing. If they rest on sand, the water gets down there, the sand's going to erode, and it tips and cracks, causes cracks in the building. Dubai, the whole city is built like that, and they also built one of the largest uh, underground malls in the world, all built below sea level, and that is rising. And I actually talked with a building engineer who uh, came to see me for a health issue, and he said that it's the worst-kept secret in Dubai. Every contractor, every architect knows damn well that that city is doomed, yet they're all making money, so nobody wants to tell the people in power, stop writing the checks, you've done it all wrong, this is all going to be a nightmare. Beautiful architecture, I commend them on their architecture but just stupid in how it was done. Give us your idea about that. Now, one other thing. I was recently out in, in, uh, well, I was in Atlanta, and they're they're oblivious to the fact that they're living without adequate aquifers and almost went dry there last year. In California, and I'll be back in California in a couple weeks filming, I generally go from one end of the state to the other end, the whole state when I'm filming, because I stop at different areas to film people for different films and I see more brush fires I see more burnt land and then when you drive through the San Joaquin Valley up around Fresno you see farms that are simply closed you see ghost towns I'd never seen that before in California and all the time I've been going out there and I stop and fill up the gas in the car and I talk with people and they say oh we got a bad here we had 80,000 workers in this county that didn't work this year because there wasn't the water. It's not the soil. It's the water because there's a limitation on how much water is being channeled from the main canal going this in the Sierra uh, uh, Madras down through that area, that gigantic canal that was built in the 1930s. Now, you don't see about this. You don't hear about the fact that they're not raising food out there because they don't have water, and that's America's breadbasket. So we have places that used to have uh, communities, and I saw this too, where they would build a lake, a man artificial lake, and then around that lake they would build a golf course, and then on the golf course they would have anywhere from several hundred homes to two or three thousand homes at high end, and then around that they would build their walls so they'd have a nice gated community for themselves. Now there's mud poles because there's no water. And all across America now, in these states, 16 major states, they've been using water like, it's, like there's no end to it, and now there is an end. And now the aesthetics of living in those areas, uh, golf courses are hard hit. Um, they, don't, they can't be given the water. And even when I was in Spain recently, you see gardens that at one time were beautiful gardens dead because they won't allow any water because they were running out of water, especially in Barcelona. So talk about America, the crisis that we are in now and where it's likely to go. And we're not talking about it. We see in California brush <coughs> fires, drought. We see over-urbanization and urban sprawl. We, we, see, we see health diseases like the particulate matter in the air causing pinholes in the lungs of people, especially children. And I don't see any effort to come to grips with the fact that at some point someone's going to have to bite the political bullet and say, friends... We must start an orderly, systematic reevaluation of how we're going to move a lot of people out of these major cities and move them to areas where they'll have a chance to survive and have a quality of life because the cities cannot be the way they are in the future. Your thoughts, please. Well, um, the, um, the numbers I've seen on uh, California for this year's um, crops indicate there are at least a half million acres of some of the world's most productive cropland that's idled because, as you indicated, there's 
no water to irrigate uh, um, these the, these fields with, um, and it has left a lot of people unemployed, and it will reduce the uh, uh, fruit and vegetable um, crops uh, in um, in California. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I've also thought about, you mentioned rising sea level and and some of the more vulnerable uh, uh, cities and and uh, coastal regions. Um, you know, it would it it will create an interesting economic situation where real estate prices in the coast, low-lying coastal regions and and coastal cities um, like New Orleans or Miami or uh, what have you, real estate prices in those regions will be going down and and could be going down very fast once it once we begin to see and and to realize what's happening with sea level. The other situation would be inland where real estate prices would be soaring because so many people would be migrating from coastal regions to the interior uh, parts of the country. And it strikes me as being sort of interesting that we have real estate prices moving very rapidly in opposite directions in different parts of the country. Um, In that vein, I saw where um, Florida this past year lost, I think it was 28,000 people the first time in decades and decades that Florida has had any, uh, any population loss. Um, the, um, the other question that, I, that comes to mind when I think of these things is, you know, what if three years from now um, scientists, maybe the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, for example, announces that we've determined that the melting of the Greenland ice sheet is irreversible and that we're looking at some very very rapid melting um, of the sort you were describing and a um, substantial rise in, um, in sea level. How do we answer the next generation that says, you know, once this becomes clear, this is this is happening. When they say, "Why didn't you do something?" When there was still time, how could you leave us a world descending into chaos? Um, and what we could see is, for the first time, social fracturing along generational lines. We, we know about social fracturing because we see it along religious and tribal and ethnic um, and racial lines, but we've never seen it before within a society along generational lines. And, and that, I think, is, is um, uh, a troubling and fascinating sort of social phenomenon that we may be facing if we don't get our act together um, in a hurry. How would you see this manifesting? Well, um, it would affect family uh, structures. Um, it certainly would affect um, our ability to work together. It might, it might um, lead to a an overall decline um, in the in the respect for uh, for government, uh, for example, because government obviously. Uh, would be at the center of this. Um, I don't know um, what all the consequences would be and, and the types of fallout, but it does seem to me that it's it's worth someone beginning to to think about, um, and and it, it should be an anthropologist or you know a sociologist and 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 a psychologist. I mean, the the other interesting question is. What would be the effect on us, um, on our sense of self, a sense of who we are, our sense of self-respect, if we realize it's our generation that's blown it? And well, it is our generation that's blown it. Right. It's, it's not an if. <laughs> it's, but I, I, mean, don't think, I don't think most of us have realized it yet. Well, we should, because we've got to get over ourselves. This whole focus upon how bright and we, the bright and best 
college grads from Harvard and all the other schools, that somehow there's an entitlement that these people should be the policy makers and the opinion leaders, a whole generation grown where no kid was allowed to be responsible for any choice they made. There was a safety net made by the parents under. There were 10,000 pillow-down cushions for every choice you made that was wrong. So you just fell into feathers. Boy, was there a difference between our generation and the greatest generation, our parents' generation, who grew up in the Great Depression. Oh, and, no, no question. And, and, and so, though we did a lot of good things, we've done a lot of bad things. And right now, almost all the bad things happening at the policy level are from the people in positions of power and control on Wall Street and others. Now, I want to go in a little different direction here for a moment, all right? Let me just reintroduce the show for people come on board. My guest, you're listening to Dr. Lester Brown. And he is arguably one of the most influential thinkers today in the world. He is the founder of um, a very important part of the environmental movement, uh, has worked uh, as an advisor of Secretary of Agriculture, and he founded the World Watch Institute, the influential watch organization on global environmental issues, and the publisher of the State of the World and World Watch Reports, author of many books as well. That said, now my question for you is this. We do not look at the consequences of having an environment that is polluted. The pesticides, for example, we can now link to an increase in leukemia. We can link it to testicular cancer. We have all this research now showing that when we are living around all these toxins, all these artificial pollutants, which are part and parcel of our negligence on the environment, we pay a price. Now, industry has refused to acknowledge this. The government's refused to acknowledge this. But thank goodness we have some very dedicated NGO organizations and individual scientists who have brought this forward. Talk about now what happens when we live in an environment not only that is not sustainable, but is actually hostile and then now is polluted. You fly into, when, when I fly into L.A. an hour later, my eyes are red. And they don't see it there. The, and, and I'm looking at places where you can't, you know, you can't breathe the air easily. It's polluted. And we have adapted to this instead of saying, no, I should not live in a polluted environment. Please take us in this area of pollution, not only in America, start here, but then worldwide, where we don't even think about the pollution that people have to live in, including, I might mention, where the swine flu originated down in that village down in South America that was a factory farm owned by an American company that had had a history of massive runoff of the pig manure going into their groundwater where the hospitals and the nurses and doctors said constantly they had this going on for years and nobody in the government and nobody in that industry would pig clean up that pig farm where all this originated. Your thoughts, please. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that we're beginning to see um, is the consequences of the pollution that's been going on for some time. And you mentioned some examples in this country. To me, one of the most interesting uh, and one of the most tragic um, situations in the world now is the um, epidemic level of cancer that is uh, developing in China. Um, as you know, in low-income countries, the principal source of death is infectious diseases. But then as you move up the economic ladder, then you, you leave the infectious diseases behind, and it's mostly cardiovascular diseases, heart attacks, strokes, and so forth that are the, the principal source of death. But in China, they've, they've moved beyond the point where infectious disease is the major source of death to where cancer is the leading source of death. More people die of cancer in China than anything else. And in, in some places, um, like Jiangsu province, which is on the coast just north of Shanghai, very prosperous, heavily industrialized province. Um, and the cancer rate there is four times the cancer rate in, in China as a whole, which is already elevated. And what we're seeing in different parts of China, and these are data released by the China Ministry of Health, by the way, um, what we're seeing in different communities in China is cancer epidemics, but different types of cancer because of different types of pollution in the local environment. 
But if ever a society polluted its environment with little concern for the effects, it, it would be uh, China. And what is particularly disturbing here is that we already see these greatly elevated levels of cancer in the society, but given what we know about the lag time between exposure to pollutants and to the actual development of cancer, um, we can assume, I think, um, that there will be um, uh, enormous future uh, increases in the incidence of, of various types of cancer um, in, in China. Um, and, and sometimes these things um, um, are, are much more meaningful when you uh, sort of run into personal examples. I was reading, I think it was in the New York Times, about a young woman in a province in south central China. Uh, she was an outstanding student, uh, you know, in school and, and, and into high school and clearly was headed to a university, maybe even studying abroad in the United States. And at about the age of 15, she was, I don't know, a sophomore or junior in high school, um, her grades began to fall. And her mother really got after her because she knew she could, uh, could do better. She was such an exceptional student. And finally, her mother took her to a doctor, and what they discovered was um, uh, progressive neurological damage from exposure to um, a pollutant. It could have been lead, but I'm not certain. But um, just to see this very talented, uh, intelligent um, uh, teenager uh, who had such a bright future and to see it evaporate um, before her eyes um, uh, was to me a, a sort of a tragic example of what what's happening in, in you know, um, you can multiply that by probably by the millions in China. Um, and um, um, so, so anyhow, it's, um, it's one of the reasons why I, th I think the Chinese have suddenly realized that burning more and more coal is not the answer and why they've suddenly begun to move uh, so, uh, so rapidly with wind energy, for example, and with um, they've taken over um, as the world leading manufacturer of solar cells, um, they're probably going to bypass the U.S. in new wind capacity installed uh, within the next few months. Um, so they're just, um, I think they're beginning to realize that the risks associated with continuing down their, their, their coal, um, basically their, their fossil fuel uh, laden um, uh, or driven um, economy, I think they're the costs are going to be pretty high in terms of, of human health. What do you think the Chinese are going to do about the fact that they had the most uh, rapid encroachment of the desert into their farmlands and towns and cities of any nation on Earth for a major population? They haven't paid attention to this in decades. It was all their energy and money went into developing these megacities, including 16 of the world's largest 20 cities are in China. And uh, these are gigantic cities, but they didn't take into account water, sewage processing. It's amazing how they lacked full awareness that each detail of how to have a group of people live together with the quality of life and then not care about where is the water going to come from? Where are we going to get rid of all this waste material from all these millions of people each day? Uh, where's their food going to come from? They're all upper middle class now. They all want to eat steak and and have an American uh, lifestyle, and all the while the desert's coming in, and no one paid attention outside of, uh, uh, w seemingly within within their main Plato Bureau. Your thoughts? Well, the <clears throat> the growth in um, uh, the expansion of deserts in um, uh, northern and western China is, is is really extraordinary. I remember reading. Um, uh, some time back, um, there's a bi-weekly science report that comes from the U.S. Embassy, um, and it has some, some pretty good material in it. And um, there was a section on mergers and acquisitions, and you, you, you automatically think corporations. But what they were talking about was deserts expanding to the point where deserts were merging and larger deserts were beginning to expand and swallow up small ones, hence the, the title of the article, Mergers and Acquisitions. But um, according to the Chinese, there are now 
There have been some 24,000 villages abandoned in northern and western China. I mean, that's millions and millions of people. Um, and they've migrated to the cities. And so the other side of the expanding desert uh, village abandonment is um, urban growth. And you're right, cities, urban populations in China have been growing uh, uh, very fast over the last uh, two or three um, decades and are not doing a very good job of dealing with, with water issues, uh, with water supply questions, or with the disposal of, uh, um, of waste. Um, one of the things I find interesting about uh, projections by social scientists, whether it's economists at the, at the World Bank um, or demographers at the UN, is that they when they make their projections, uh, you know, that the world economy is going to triple by 2050 or what have you, they assume there will be enough water to support this. There will be enough um, uh, various uh, mineral resources, enough forest products, um, um, enough energy, and, and so forth. And um, I see demographers projecting increases in population in countries where the wells are already going dry. I think of Yemen, for example, where water tables are falling uh, all across the country, three to six feet a year. And this is a country that has one of the fastest population growth rates, um, six children per woman uh, on average in the country. Um, and its population growth is soaring and its water tables are, are plummeting. That's going to be, that, that story is not going to have a happy ending. And I think we're going to be looking at, at the total disintegration of Yemen as these water stresses begin to, uh, to take effect. Um, and it will break up um, in, in the same way that uh, Somalia has. Do you know what's interesting when you see the people um, who are the victims of this tsunami yesterday? When you hear their stories, and they're, they're sad stories, and you feel compassion for the people, you have to ask, or at least I do, you knew you were in a part of the world that was going to be susceptible. Why didn't you realize you could also be susceptible and move your home further back, move it back a quarter mile, move it up the mountain? Now, everybody ran up the mountain when the earthquake happened. It was a five-minute earthquake. They knew with a five-minute earthquake there's going to be a major tsunami. And yet no one says, you know, we, we should have listened. I, and I'm thinking, my goodness, why can't we be proactive in preventing these catastrophes? I mean, you look at you, you drive down Sunset Boulevard, you look, you'll see homes built literally on poles off the side of a cliff. Expensive real estate so they can get the view. There's an earthquake, they're all gone. The, the, if, when the big one comes, there, it could be anywhere from 7.5 to 8.5 um, you're going to have massive casualties and destruction, and yet you see no effort to say, well, okay, you know, I'm going to look calmly and rationally where I could be, where I'd be out of this. We're not doing any of that. Even in New Orleans, I was recently in New Orleans, and as a, I went through all the, I went through all the streets where the, uh, the homes were flooded and, and uh, all the wards. And then I went into uh, the French Quarter, and you smell the uh, mold and mildew the moment you walk in the French Quarter. And every one of the places I went to, you could smell it. And I asked one of the people in one of the little stores, I said, what are you doing about this? They said, we can't do anything because the mold is inside the wood, and these are historical buildings, and you can't rip them up. So we are getting sick all the time, respiratory conditions, uh, and it stinks all the time, and there's nothing we can do about it. When you look around, that we're living in the wrong places. We're not living where we're sustainable, not only here but around the world. At what point do you think we might finally get it, that we should live where we can live a quality of life that is sustainable, in balance with nature, instead of assuming, as we have up to this point, this kind of this environmental um, manifest destiny? We're smarter than nature. We can conquer nature. We've got the machines. We've got the mindset. We've got technology. We'll just redo this landscape the way we want it, irrespective 
of the long-term consequences. Your thought, please. Well, in thinking about New Orleans, for example, I've wondered why um, we've insisted on rebuilding it. I mean, if, um, if, if I understand what's happening with climate um, and what, what we're likely to see with, um, with, with sea level, um, it's, New Orleans is not where you want to be rebuilding. And incidentally, one of the reasons why I think Florida's population has um, actually shrank a little bit last year um, is because um, I think there are enough hurricanes there now and enough damage, and and when you do, when you go through the rebuilding thing enough times, you begin to ask yourself, you know, is this what I want to spend my savings on the rest of my life rebuilding uh, these? And in a lot of places, you can't get insurance now um, against um, um, storm damage like hurricanes and so forth. So. I have a feeling that we're beginning to see some of the early signs of, of, of public realization that Florida is probably not going to be an ideal place to live um, in, the, uh, um, in the decades ahead as, uh, as climate change continues to unfold. I absolutely agree. I want to thank you very much for being on today. We're out of time. It's always a joy to have you on because you share so many interesting insights that allows us to think in ways we wouldn't otherwise be thinking. Gary, could I just mention that the book is online sure. at earthpolicy.org. Uh, you can uh, download Plan B 4.0 free of charge. It's there for the, for the reading. Thank you very much. My guest, Dr. Lester Brown, Conversations with Remarkable Minds, our global environmental situation.